Being an informed citizen is not always easy. You want to know what's going on to stay up to date with the big news stories that affect your fellow humans across the planet. But the non-stop deluge of important events makes it difficult to completely understand the headlines. This is where we hope the explanation from the BBC World Service can help. I'm Anu Anand, and in this series, I asked some of my BBC colleagues to help me break down big global news events using archive recordings made on the ground to make sense of why these stories are important. Many Iranians have been protesting since last Friday, protests that quickly turned into calls for regime change. Today, we look at Iran, its Islamic revolution, and we ask, can Iran ever change? This is the explanation from the BBC World Service. Iran's theocratic rulers are perpetually at odds with America and many Western countries. States like these constitute an axis of evil. But how did this deep and bitter enmity begin? And what impact does it have on Iran and the rest of the world? Stay with the explanation for the next 15 minutes to understand how religion and politics in Iran combine to dominate its policies and what it would take to change that. Settle in. So, I'm ready. Are you sure? (laughs) Rana Rahimpur was born in Iran and is a journalist for BBC Persian, the Farsi language service that broadcasts globally from London. She's perfectly placed to help me understand Iran from both the personal and professional perspective. In 1979, four years before Rana was born, an event like no other in Iran's modern history was broadcast to the world, an event that would profoundly shape her life and the lives of millions of Iranians. This is the man they call the father of the revolution. And this is the moment that millions in Iran have been waiting for. After his long years in exile, the first hesitant steps of Ayatollah Khomeini on Iranian soil. A Muslim religious leader in black robes and turban, accompanied by the world's media, touched down on an Air France flight in Tehran. Millions of adoring supporters jammed the streets to see Ayatollah Ruhollah Khomeini, the central figure in Iran's modern story. His Islamic revolution continues to shape life in Iran even today. It's extraordinary how one man can command such adoration, how so many people can believe that this frail old priest holds all the answers to Iran's problems. The word Ayatollah is used by Iran's Shia Muslims and translates to reflection of God. It is an honorific title given to religious scholars who achieve a loyal following. So Rana, how did the revolution and its legacy, this complete change in identity, how did that play into your childhood? So the revolution was an attempt by many towards freedom at least the people that I grew up with. They wanted democracy, they wanted freedom. Ayatollah Khomeini seemed to many to be Iran's saviour. He challenged the country's decadent Western-backed monarch and triumphed. It was the most incredible scene. Nobody could possibly know how many millions lined the route of his 20-mile drive through Tehran. They'd come from all over the country to see the man they acknowledge as the only true leader of Iran. He's hugely charismatic. His eyes, his aura, his outfit, everything about him. And don't forget, at the time, the Iranian people were very religious. So he was a man of God. And he was talking about how Iran has been taken advantage of by by the West and and the Americans. And he knew how to play those notes that worked very well. He was extremely wise. To understand Ayatollah Khomeini's popularity, it's important to know that he overturned decades of Western interference and profiteering in Iran. This all began in 1908, when a British prospector discovered oil, setting off a long conflict over control of Iran's oil profits. 
In 1941, as the Allies battled the Nazis during World War II, British forces invaded Iran to protect the Anglo-Iranian oil company, which supplied vital fuel to the Allied war effort. After the war in 1953, oil was once again center stage. The British and American secret services staged a coup to topple Iran's popularly elected prime minister, Mohammad Mossadegh, in part because he nationalized Iranian oil, taking vast profits from the company that would later become British Petroleum. The British and Americans installed Iran's monarch, Mohammad Reza Pahlavi, known simply as the Shah, in Mossadegh's place. The foreign coup and the Shah's brutal rule set the stage for conflict. There was always this uh, nationalist feeling towards Mossadegh, the prime minister who was ousted through the coup. And I remember as a teenager, I used to have a poster of Mossadegh on my wall because he was this hero who nationalized Iranian oil. Under the Shah and his Western allies, Iranian oil profits flowed once again to Western companies. A new American-trained secret service arrested, imprisoned, and executed many Iranian opposition leaders. That's until the return of Ayatollah Khomeini in 1979. A simple cleric, he'd spoken against the Shah and endured years of exile. By 1979, his support was so widespread, the Shah was forced to flee Iran, setting the stage for Khomeini's triumphant return. We saw thousands of people storm the parliament buildings. They did a war dance under the chandeliers, ripped up photographs of the Shah, mashed bottles of liquor, and tore up magazine photographs of nude women. In one fell swoop, it seemed, Iran had become an Islamic republic. The atrocities started just a few months after the revolution. I remember that my father had a colleague whose three sons, they were all arrested and they were all executed and they were all teenagers because they were distributing leaflets that belonged to a leftist group. And also the, the compulsory hijab started soon after the revolution. My mother was a very modern woman. She didn't wear the hijab. She was very fashionable. She liked her short skirts and she had a job. She drove. So for her time, she was a very progressive woman. A few months after the revolution, they were told that they had to cover up. Otherwise, they couldn't go to work anymore. And those shocks, just one after another, meant that people soon realized that what was promised was not going to be delivered. By the time Rana was in school in the late 1980s, the Ayatollah ruled with an iron fist. The Shah's old secret service was gone, but a new ideologically driven militia, the Islamic Revolutionary Guard, police society. And the West, specifically America, became enemy number one. These are the children of the Iranian Revolution. Ten years after the toppling of the Shah, and in a country with the highest birth rate in the world, a new generation is being instructed in the fundamentals of Islam. At school, every morning, we had to line up and we had to chant Death to America. As I was growing up in Iran, that was definitely part of the national conversation, that the Americans have taken advantage of us for so many years. That was part of the history books at school that we were taught, and we were expected to participate in that. In 1989, Ayatollah Khomeini died. But his unique blueprint for Iran endured. Its government remained a combination of theocracy, that is, rule by religious leaders, and presidential democracy. A new supreme religious leader, Ayatollah Khamenei, took his place above the elected president, and he remains in place even today. But the battle between conservative and moderate clerics and their competing visions of what an Islamic Republic should look like intensified. In 1997, that battle came to a head during Iran's presidential election. Voters in Iran have elected a moderate cleric as the country's new president. Right from the start, it was clear from Iranian state television's results program that there'd been a landslide. Khatami had a more than two-to-one majority over his main rival. What's important to remember is that the Iranian population is very young, very modern and very westernized. So they want a normal life. And more importantly, they want 
economic stability. And they don't see the current political leaders of the country as capable people to deliver this. And that's why there is this tension. The election had turned into a referendum on the way Iran has been governed for the past 18 years. And people had emphatically voted against all the restrictions and inefficiency and corruption of the government. He became a president that could deliver for only two years until the hardliners got their, their, themselves together and then they started shutting down all the newspapers. But the fact that President Khatami was elected with, in such a landslide victory, to his own surprise, uh, made it clear that the quest for change in Iran is very serious. And that hasn't changed. If anything, it, it's even more now than it was in 1997. Fast forward to 2009 and to another election. Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, a conservative who had already served one term as president, was announced the winner of the race. But there were serious questions about the legitimacy of the vote counting. Nothing has been seen on the streets of Tehran like this since the revolution, right back in 1979. These people feel that their election has been stolen from them. Uh, Revolutionary Guards affiliated news websites said that Ahmadinejad had won the election with 63% of the votes. And there was just shock and awe in our newsroom, thinking, when did they count the votes? This can't be right. This government won't allow us to say what we want. We want freedom! Iran's reformist movement was being crushed. Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, who moved Iran back to confrontation with his hatred of Israel and his support for Iran's nuclear program, served two terms. No reformist has since been elected. Rana, what do you think is behind the reaction from the hardliners? What are they afraid of? Uh, there are several reasons for that. The uh, Islamic ideology is one thing. Their anti-imperialism ideology is the other. And on top of that, especially in the last 10 years, is corruption. A lot of people are earning a lot of money from the sanctions and Iran's isolation. That's why they prefer the status quo, because if Iran joins the international community, if Iran becomes what some people call a normal country, they can't make as much money as they are now. So that means it's not really just about religion, which is how you tend to think of Iran. Definitely, it's, a, it's about power, it's about money as well. Iranians have reacted with predictable outrage to the American trade blockade imposed on them by President Clinton. The Gulf is the closest that Iran has to a giant cash point. The European Union will no longer buy any oil from the Persian state. And so Iran loses 20% of its oil market. Rana, sanctions have been another really big theme any time that the West doesn't like what Iran is doing, they use sanctions as a tool to try and influence Tehran. Can you share your own memories, your own experiences of sanctions? Sanctions meant that there was less money and less money meant that things had to ra- be rationed. So growing up during the Iran-Iraq war, we had to queue up to buy meat, rice, oil, just the basics. Funny enough, every time that a new round of sanctions were announced, I had the fear that there could be war. And that shadow was always part of our lives growing up. And more recently, the economic effect of the sanctions have got worse. After the attacks of September 11th, 2001, When Islamists hijacked planes and hit the World Trade Center in New York and other American targets, there was actually hope that Iran might develop better relations with the U.S. The two countries shared a common enemy in Afghanistan's Taliban movement. The Iranians even shared military intelligence about Afghanistan with Washington. But any hope of good relations was destroyed in 2002 by then U.S. President George W. Bush. Iran aggressively pursues these weapons and exports terror. States like these constitute an axis of evil 
Rana, when you think about relations with the West, I mean, you say that Iran is young and it's westernized, but do you think that America and the West have helped or have they harmed the quest for reform and freedom and democracy? I think they've made life very difficult for the reformists. President Khatami, President Rouhani, these were people who were actively seeking a normal relation with the West. But then when George W. Bush announced they put Iran on the axis of uh, evil list or when President Trump withdrew from Iran's nuclear deal, that pushed the voice of reform back by many years. I know it didn't help. In 2015, Iran and several world powers, including the United States, signed a landmark deal. More than a decade of negotiations have culminated in a deal on Iran's nuclear program that should allow sanctions to be lifted. But U.S. President Donald Trump withdrew from the deal in 2018. There are those who are hardline and they were like, huh, we told you so. The Americans can't be trusted. And then there were those who felt betrayed and they said, we behaved, we negotiated, we let your monitors in. You left the deal and you're punishing us. And funny enough, there were another part of the Iranians who said, this is not a bad thing because it will put more pressure on the Islamic Republic and it can lead to regime change. So, Rana, the question is whether Iran can reconcile the hardliners and the reformers. The society is fed up. People are hungry for change and any opportunity they find, they will express it. Before, it used to be through ballot box. Now it tends to be street protests that are violently cracked down by the regime. So the quest for change is there. But at the moment, the political elite have the power to suppress those calls for change. Thanks, Rana. That's Rana Rahimpur of BBC Persian, explaining how the history of Iran's Islamic revolution intersects with her own and what it'll take for Iran to change. You've been listening to The Explanation with me, Anu Anand, on the BBC World Service. Please subscribe and share The Explanation on BBC Sounds. Thank you for listening. There will be more from the documentary podcast soon. The documentary is just one of our BBC World Service podcasts. There are many others to choose from. We launched the Global News Podcast back in 2007 and a decade and a half later, it is still the most downloaded podcast from the BBC World Service. The Global News Podcast. The Global News Podcast. The Global News Podcast. I think there's lots of reasons it's still so popular. It gives you a global view of what's going on in the news. You'll hear stories that you might not get to find out about anywhere else. And because we have offices all the way around the globe, you can often get a local perspective on a story no matter where it's happening. Pakistan. Nicaragua. Ethiopia. Sumatra. And it's not all just wars and disaster and catastrophe. We also cover stories that are funny or curious or unexpected. How tomato sauce is getting involved in the space race. Because it's important that this is a podcast that you actually really want to listen to. And finally, we report on a really big purchase, a dinosaur. That's the Global News Podcast. All the news from around the world. And we might even make you smile. This was really quite extraordinary. Just search for the Global News Podcast.